Vic and I were talking, oh, about, what, a year ago? We wanted a project to do. We wanted to look at S-bursts in high detail. We said, well, how do you do that? I mean, you can't do that with the regular FSX spectrograph. You can't do it with an SDR-14. You, you really need a high-speed digitizer type of spectrograph to do that. Well, Vic had built a tunable wideband receiver some time ago. Uh, was a fixed frequency down converter affair. It was five could see 500 kilohertz of the spectrum and used high speed tape. And uh, refresh my memory. How did you read that out? How did you read the tape out? Was it was it audio or did it use the acoustic optical? To uh, it was it was converted uh, through the tape slowdown. The data was dropped down to audio range and then. Process with an audio spectrum. With an audio spectrograph, that's right, that's right. Photograph, you know, drove a horizontal trace on an oscilloscope, which was photographed with a shutterless motion picture camera. So, yet another type of optical spectrograph. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was kind of the, the, the first stab at it, and I believe there are photos in the Jupiter catalog. <clears throat> yeah, that some, of that. Them, some of the ones okay. I saw were from that machine. Um, some years later, Wes Greenman designed another one that was about a megahertz and a half wide. Uh, his used some surplus uh, spy radio gear to get that frequency range. Uh, also used some uh, high speed tape. And I believe he read it out, I guess the same way. Same way. I, I, can't, I can't remember. Same way. Um, they just got a better tape recorder. Yeah, but, right, exactly. And then there was some dead time, and then we came along and we, we kind of resurrected Wes's old equipment, and we started looking at it and seeing what we could do with it. And well, maybe this radio didn't act quite as good as we thought it did, and this other piece of equipment might not be so good. And long story short, Wes built a bunch of filters, and Vic built some up converters and a bunch of filters, and Jim Sky made a few little modifications to RSS to display milliseconds, and. We ended up with a tunable, a new third version of the tunable wideband receiver. There, there's a picture of it. It's basically the same picture Dick showed you. We'll show you what all these little modules do in there, but that, that's the thing. There's just the front and the back of it. And it's tunable from 17 to 33, so it covers our range of interest perfectly. Uh, it's got, it'll spit out 2 megahertz in a crack. Uh, which we're looking to maybe take it a little more up to four, but then uh, we'll see. About a 40 dB dynamic range. Noise figure's a little high, but most of that's coming from the digitizer. Uh, digitizers aren't known for their super low noise. Uh, we use a 10 megasample per second ADC, 12 bits. We do all the post processing in Mathematica via Mathematica's FFT functioning. Uh, and our resolution is 205 microseconds in time, and we can see about a 5 kilohertz frequency resolution. And that's across 411 output bins. And the reason it's only 411 uh, instead of 2048 is because RIF isn't at 1 megahertz. RIF is at 2.8. And we're sampling at 10, so we get up to 5 megahertz to play with. So we're really looking at uh, 2.8 to 4.8. Did I say 3? I meant to say 3.8. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Close enough. Whatever. There's a basic block diagram of it. I mean, you know, the RF comes in from the antenna. It goes through some up conversion, tuning, down conversion, yet more filtering, 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 and more filtering. Uh, then into a gauge CS1228 EC that Dr. Higgins was kind enough to lend to us. It really, it was an expensive piece of hardware and it works really good. Um, it's driven by a little piece of software called CompuScope that takes the samples in real time at 10 mega samples per second and stores them out to the hard drive. Then we come along, take those files off the hard drive through Mathematic, convert them to SPS files that Jim Sky's spectrograph software can read, and we <coughs> look at them that way and make pictures and find drift rates and all that other fun stuff. Here's a little more detail of the radio itself. The first portion coming in from the antenna, 
we're actually using a multi-coupler, which we already had. Again, this, this radio wasn't designed from in the typical fashion where you, you set up your <laughs> design parameters and then go to build a radio. We kind of figured out what we had and then what we didn't have and sort of evolved. But anyway, the first step's a multi-coupler, which just has got a bandpass filler in it and some gain, about 13 dB gain. Uh, after that, it goes to an up-converter. Uh, the reason it goes to an up-converter is because we're actually using an R8500 as the tuning element. And we're doing that because I can pick off the 10.7 IF out of the R8500, which has a nice fat 4 megahertz bandwidth coming out that's actually pretty flat. It's about 4 megahertz to the 1 dB points, which is pretty nice and wide. Anyway, that's why we need to up-convert it, because you can't get 4 megahertz out of an HF receiver. It just doesn't happen. So it goes, then it goes through the, the uh, R8500. Uh, and one thing about that is you've got to kill the AGC on the 8500. And we do that pretty simply by jamming two and a half volts into the AGC port, which just holds it wide open. And, and we measured it too, we tried it. it it's, it's nice and linear, and it works great. And it doesn't seem to hurt anything. I did unplug it and try to use the receiver normally, and nothing burned out. So. Seems to work. <laughs> when we take the, take the IF out, uh, then we, we down convert it to the 4.8 megahertz, uh, and that's what is then sent to the digitizer. Here's, uh, can anybody even see that? Here's <laughs> 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 a gargantuan spreadsheet. But what this is was kind of our, our, our design worksheet. Uh, thingy here. Each one of these is, is a block within the receiver system, all the way from the antenna, way down to the digitizer itself. And each one's got a gain or an amplification, a noise figure, and we're, what we're trying to do is trace the noise figure all the way through the system. We're looking at the gains, trying to see, do we have too much gain here, are we going to go into compression, that sort of thing. All this data right here is plotted here, and that's what these little red lines are. This is where these elements are going into compression, so we, we got to keep the signal below that, but we don't want it so far down here that it's not enough to drive the digitizer. So this is, you know, best path through the maze is what we came up with. There's the conversion scheme, yet another plot that nobody can read, but it just helped us keep track of what was getting converted where and whether it was high side injection or low side injection, whether the pass band was getting mirrored or not mirrored, and what was actually coming out the end of this thing into the digitizer. It's a really good method too. It's worked, worked really well. There's a schematic of what is actually driving the tubal wide band. <laughs> Might should have given this talk after the next one, but regardless, Remember I mentioned last night to most of you that I have eight element uh, TFD array and we're picking off RCP and LCP. There's the hybrid that does that. We're mostly looking at RCP because Jupiter's mostly RCP, unless it isn't. Uh, so the so tunnel wide band is normally connected to the 13 dB output or to that multi coupler, like we said before. And well, there's, there's a nifty picture of three multi couplers. We, uh, and there's where it gets up converted, going through a nice uh, 55 megahertz low pass that I think Wes made that one. I know he made the next one. He, he made the hard one, the 64 to 82 megahertz uh, output filter there. It's a really tough to design power filter, but it's got a really deep notch at 97, so none of the LO is going through the rest of the system. And that's what all that stuff looks like. And, I assume everybody knows what an R8500 looks like. In case you don't, there it is. This chart is what we use to figure out, okay, when we tune our R8500 somewhere, what RF block are we actually looking at? And for example, if we tune to 72 megahertz on the 8500, we're actually looking at 25 megahertz. And then, of course, plus or minus one, so we're actually looking for 24 to 26 megahertz of the RF coming in from the antenna. Yeah, I agree. And here's the down converter block. Uh, 
got nothing too much special going on in there. Thanks to Dick, it was all made, and all I had to do was bolt it all together. So, thank you. Uh, what else? That's, that's enough. There is the digitizer that Dr. Hagen has lent us. Works super. We're using the most sensitive uh, plus or minus 50 millivolt scale, uh, and we're using 10 mega samples per second. It just bolts into a regular PC. We're running Windows XP. Runs great. Doesn't stall. Nothing. There's, in fact, there's the whole setup. Uh, there's the 8500, the TWB stuff that we put together, and there's just a rack mount PC that contains the digitizer. This is the software that the people who built the digitizer, Gage is the company. That's the Gage software driving that digitizer. In fact, there's an FFT showing a 3.8 megahertz test signal that's coming in through this Step attenuator right here. Whoops. Stupid buttons. And there's what you get. Um, we do a graph like this. <laughs> Again, two talks from now you'll see for the spectrograph users group. You go through a step cal on your spectrograph, and this is what you can create. This curve represents these different colors when your color offset and your color gain are at such and such a value. Now you change any of that and your calibration is shot. But we needed to know where we were and that's where we are. Software. Again, there's another picture of the gauge software. Just sits on the PC and runs and stores everything in the disk. After it comes out of the disk, we run through a Mathematica routine that basically just does an FFT and a lot of a lot of nothing else. It, it, it converts it into a format that can be read by Radio Sky Spectrograph software, but it, it really doesn't do a whole lot to it. Uh, in fact, there's the mathematical representation right there, this bottom one. That's all it does, but it does it millions and millions and millions of times for each file because you have to do that equation for every, every sample 10 million times a second. We also were able to get audio out of this, and we did that by up-converting it to 16-bit uh, data just by multiplying it by 16 to add four more bits to everything. Uh, we ran it through some uh, high-pass filter, uh, down-converted it to almost baseband. Uh, the yellow was a 4.82, and our high side was 4.8, so it was almost there. Another low-pass filter, and then just stored it as a WAV file. I, I should mention, all of it, none of this is real in the sense there was nothing tangible. This is all processing done in Mathematica. And here are some observations. That, that's actually the, the TWB right there, and there's the TWB display right there. There's a frequency check from WWV, and you can see that's coming through just fine at 20 megahertz. So, figured after all the different up and down conversions and ins and outs, and, and conversion to RSS, it actually worked great. Right. Uh, had 19 tries this year to look at something. We only, had, we only got 11 good ones. We had three storms that were just nothing there, and five that were washed out with the every once in a while present line noise, which happens. Just get with your power company, keep nagging them, they do come out. They, they, will, they will fix it. Overall, we collected about a half a terabyte of data. And this is what we get through all of our labors and hard work and everything else. This is the normal RSS spectrogram that we've been seeing the past day or two. This little, well, bigger box here is blown up over here, and this little skinny box represents about one pixel wide, left and right, of the original data here. And that one pixel wide, this, this is an actual spectrogram taken by another FSX and the TWB at the same time. So this is actually correlated here. The TWB is showing about 210 milliseconds left to right here which is about one pixel wide up here. So when we're seeing these S-bursts, just as little teeny hash marks in the FSX display, 
this is what's really happened. The uh, negative drift rate has burst. Bear that in mind as we see the rest of the uh, rest of the slides. Here's here's some S bursts. This, this is a, <laughs> if you notice the lettering over the right. <laughs> this is because when this was published, <laughs> everybody was doing high frequency at the bottom and low at the top. And I have a suspicion that was because it was a holdover from when people measured things in wavelength. And in that case, it would have made sense. You put the higher wavelength at the top. But unfortunately. The way we display spectrograms now, it makes everything upside down. So I inverted this S burst zoo from Rihima, who was first catalog all of these, and you'll see a lot of these in the following pictures. There's some S bursts we took back in December. There's a, who was it talked about an S burst train? Did somebody mention that? Did, did you? Okay, well, there, there's a perfect example. This little train of hash marks right here. And there's there's some pure S bursts right there. Let's see. Yeah, let's see if I got it. Okay, yeah, I did eliminate some. Let's see if I can play the audio on this one. for those of you who know your music. So each one of those descending cones is probably caused by a bunch of electrons moving up magnetic field line, linking Jupiter and Io. And as it goes up the magnetic field line, it goes from a higher magnetic field where it generates a higher frequency to a lower magnetic field strength where the frequency is lower. So that's what gives you the descending cone. Over. <laughs> Roger. Uh, it, it just some more, more so. I'm not going to play too much more of this. We'll, we'll, uh, oh, well, maybe I can. Time is two tenths of a second. Correct. Right. Correct. Which converts into. Oh gosh. Oh, you know what? <laughs> yeah, it's on this slide. It's on the notes underneath this slide. <laughs> so the little memory stick with the with all the proceedings on it. Just exit out of it and you can see that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Hey, all right. What's the radius of that plasma loop? The ion torus? Yeah, the torus. 
But the electrons generating around the magnetic field then is a much narrow, you know, smaller cylinder of electrons moving up the Moving on. End events. Again, first mentioned is something we hadn't mentioned yet. And events called N because they're narrow band. There's a beautiful example of a, that's about as pure an N event as you can get. It's, it's narrow, it's pure, it's not moving, it's just N. And that comes from Jupiter. And I don't think we know why they happen. They just kind of happen. There's one that wobbles a little bit. Then we get into the ones that are kind of, looks like some S-burst structure there, but sort of, not, uh, but they are there. More N, just wider N with smaller sub ends. And these, these, these things here. These are called fast drift shadow events because they're a shadow and they drift fastly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they're called. <laughs> Nobody knows why they happen, they just happen. Here's more. By uh, Flag and Crouch, correct? Is this yours? I think, I think it was. Another more? Yep. Okay, great. Perfect. There's these uh, uh, faster shadow events, but as you notice, this is an older paper, so they're upside down. Same here. And this is a newer paper, so they're right side up. And here's an. Uh, an S train, if you will. More little, more little shadows there. There's almost a perfect example of a shadow event right in the middle there. And here's some stuff that is just kind of defies pigeonholing. It, it, it just kind of a, a, a mess like that. <laughs> it's it's not really L bursting. It's sort of S-ish with sort of shadows. Just is, is, is there. Now we got stuff like this. I, I have no idea what to call this, except an oddity. And that is not an S burst, even though it kind of looks like one. <laughs> that was actually called a Z burst by the people who coined the term back when spectrograms were upside down. So it's, and, and, it, and it highlights a problem with our understanding of what creates this emission. If you're moving along the time axis here, you're emitting here, you're emitting here. How does it know to start emitting up here so that this lines up perfectly and ends up here, but it, but it continues to trail off over here? What? Huh? We, we don't know why that happens. Uh, Arkhipov kind of thinks, we had, had a paper come out this year that kind of thinks that it's dispersion at the source, although there are a lot of people who kind of don't agree with that. I'll leave it to, to my betters to figure that one out, but it, it does show the problem. You know, that's a, how, how would you make that structure from one birth, one bunch of electrons? You, you really kind of can't do that. It's probably more than one bunch. Like yeah. Yeah. Okay, well then how do they get together to make an organized trail right there? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's, <laughs> right there is why doing this stuff is interesting. It is something that obviously me, an amateur, can record and look at. But the same you're, characteristic you're that, 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 that is that uh, when there is an emission, you have to be in the beam to see it. There right. are plenty of emissions that you never see because you're yeah. not in the So this might be also, uh, but that's very complex. It's a very complex geometry. Yeah. And just a few more oddities, and here, here's the yep, last slide. This one, I've, I've never seen anything quite like this before. It, it just goes from high frequency to low over 2 megahertz, over 2 tenths of a second. It's much slower than an S-burst. It's not organized like an S-burst, but it's too short to be an end event. And, you know, there it is. What pigeonhole do you put that one in? Probably the round one over beside your desk. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.